Hello, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk on Upper GI Bleeding, Update on Management. I will first of all show some general slides on the topic, and then if time allows, I will show some short videos concentrating on endoscopic management. Now, Upper GI Bleeding is a common medical emergency. One in 2,000 adults in the UK will be admitted each year with an upper GI bleed. So a typical district hospital will see 50 to 80 cases per year per 100,000 population that it serves. So in the hospital that, that I work in, we see typically 350 cases per year, or roughly one per day. Over two-thirds of these patients are aged over 50 years, and the overall mortality is between 4 and 10%. This figure hasn't changed much in the past 20 years, despite advances in endotherapy. The mortality increases with age. The NCPOD report from 2015 showed that there were significant opportunities to improve our management of upper GI bleeding, and several guidelines exist to help us do so. These include the SIGN guideline, the BSG guideline, and the ESGE um, guidelines. The common causes of upper GI bleeding are summarized on this slide. Uh, the most important ones are peptic ulcer, which accounts for 44% of bleeds, and varices, which accounts for roughly 13% of bleeds. Um, other causes include esophagitis, gastric and duodenal erosions, portal hypertensive gastropathy, malignancy, Mallory Weiss tear, and vascular malformation. Approximately 20% of patients with upper GI bleeding uh, will have no um, abnormalities seen at endoscopy. Um, these figures uh, total to more than 100% because some patients will have more than one abnormality at endoscopy. Let us now look at the resuscitation of patients with an upper GI bleed. We should secure intravenous access with large uh, peripheral ventlons, preferably more than one. The initial fluid replacement should be done using either crystalloids or colloids. Uh, the NICE guidelines on intravenous uh, fluid replacement from 2016 suggest that we should use at least 500 ml of crystalloid over the first 15 minutes. We should anticipate the need uh, for blood transfusion. The threshold for transfusion should be based on underlying condition, hemodynamic status of the patient, and markers of tissue hypoxia. But generally speaking, we should administer blood if the hemoglobin is less than or equal to 7 grams per deciliter. Uh, we should note that one unit of red cells should raise the hemoglobin by 1 gram per deciliter. And we should also note that the initial hemoglobin and the initial hematocrit may be misleading. For example, the initial uh, hematocrit um, after the bleed, may remain at 40% uh, because it requires time uh, for hemodilution to occur. So time and fluids will result in the hematocrit then dropping to, say, um, 20. But the important message is the initial hematocrit and the initial hemoglobin may be misleading. We should also correct any coagulopathy that may be present. The NICE guidelines from 2012 give some general advice on transfusing patients uh, with an upper GI bleed. They say that we should transfuse patients with massive bleeding with blood, platelets and clotting factors in line with local protocols for managing massive bleeding. We should base our decision on blood transfusion on the full clinical picture, recognizing that over-transfusion may be as damaging as under-transfusion. We should not offer platelet transfusion if the patient is not actively bleeding and is hemodynamically stable. But we should offer platelet transfusion if there is active bleeding or if the platelet count is less than 50. We should offer FFP if the fibrinogen level is less than 1 gram per litre or if the prothrombin time or partial thromboplastin time is greater than 1.5 times the normal limit. In addition, we should offer uh, prothrombin complex concentrate, that is uh, Beriplex, if the patient is on warfarin and is actively bleeding. However, we should not use recombinant factor 7a except when all other methods have failed. 
Now, the transfusion strategy that we are adopting these days is largely based on this important paper presented in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. Uh, this was a randomized trial with 921 patients presenting with severe acute upper GI bleed. And they were randomized to receiving either uh, restrictive transfusion or liberal transfusion. Restrictive transfusion meant that the transfusion was given only when the hemoglobin was less than 7 and the target hemoglobin was between 7 and 9. In the liberal group, transfusion was given when the hemoglobin fell below 9 and the target hemoglobin was between 9 and 11. And the primary outcome was all-cause mortality um, at 45 days. This slide summarizes the main findings of the study. Um, in the restrictive group, the mortality rate um, was lower than in the liberal group. Similarly, the rate of further bleeding and the overall complication rate uh, were lower in the restrictive group compared to the liberal group. And these um, differences were all significant. Uh, the graph at the bottom of the uh, slide shows the mortality in the two groups. And if you look at the larger uh, graph, it doesn't look that different at 45 days. However, if you magnify this area of the graph, which is the um, inner graph, then you can see the 4% difference um, in the mortality at 45 days between the two groups. Now, it should be noted that most of this benefit is seen in patients with child A or B um, cirrhosis. And it should also be noted that this study was conducted in a dedicated bleed unit uh, where there was round-the-clock endoscopy service available and also uh, facilities to do uh, bloods every hour or every two hours. And so the results of this study may not be generalizable uh, to the more um, non-dedicated units that we have. Apart from resuscitating the patient, what else should we be doing at the beginning? What about using a nasogastric tube? This is a slightly controversial area. The most useful situation for a nasogastric tube is if the patient has severe hematochesia and you are not sure if this is due to an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed. If the aspirate from the nasogastric tube is positive, um, that is, if there's blood or coffee ground um, aspirated, then this indicates an upper GI bleed. The tube can also provide prognostic information. For example, if there's red blood per the nasogastric tube, then this predicts a high-risk endoscopic lesion. If there's coffee ground, then this indicates less severe or inactive bleeding. However, a negative aspirate is not as helpful because 15 to 20 percent of patients with an upper GI bleed will have a negative nasogastric aspirate. The ESGE guideline from 2015 does not recommend the use of a nasogastric tube. Let us now move on to risk stratification of patient. Risk stratification identifies patient at high risk from adverse outcomes and helps to determine disposition. That is, should the patient go to um, intensive care unit or a medical ward or um, they may even be... Uh, suitable for, to be discharged and reviewed in the outpatient. Risk stratification may help guide appropriate timing of endoscopy, and there are several such um, systems available, including Rockall, Blatchford, also known as Glasgow Score, the Addenbrooke Score, AIM-65, and several others. And of those, I think the Rockall and Blatchford scores are the best known. The Rockall scoring system first described in 1996, is a validated predictor of mortality in patients with upper GI bleed. It has two components, clinical and endoscopic. The clinical components are age, shock and comorbidity, and are scored between 0 and 3. So the maximum pre-endoscopy score is 7. The, the endoscopic components are diagnosis and presence of major stigmata of recent hemorrhage. And these are scored between 0 and 2. So the maximum post-endoscopy score is 11. Uh, 
a pre-endoscopy score of zero uh, carries a very low mortality rate and a very low re-bleed rate of 0.2%. And so it could be argued that patients with a Rockel score of zero may be suitable for early discharge. However, as the Rockel score increases, then so does the predicted mortality, increasing to nearly 50% when the pre-endoscopy score is 7. The full score um, can only be calculated after endoscopy. And again, we can see that with an increase in the Rockel score, the mortality rate increases, both in patients who bleed and those who do not bleed. So the red component uh, of this graph are patients who have rebled, and the yellow component uh, uh, represent patients who have not rebled. But in both groups, the mortality increases with Rockel score. The Blatchford score is also known as the Glasgow score and is based on readily available clinical and lab data. In other words, it does not need an endoscopy um, to, to, to obtain a score. The score is based on the blood urea, uh, the hemoglobin, the systolic blood pressure and other markers such as pulse, presence uh, of melina, presence of syncope, liver disease and cardiac disease. The lowest possible score is zero and the highest score is around 23. Um, in, the, in the study from The Lancet in 2000, um, the main uh, outcome was that if the score is greater than zero, uh, then the patient is likely to need intervention. The use of the Blatchford score is recommended by the NICE guidelines of 2012. Here uh, we see a graph showing the Blatchford score on the x-axis and uh, the patient's uh, percentage on the y-axis. The um, maroon bars represent patients uh, in whom no endotherapy was required at endoscopy, whilst the yellow bars represent patients in whom uh, therapy was required at endoscopy. And you can see uh, those patients with a Blatchford score of zero, none of them required uh, ther therapy at endoscopy, whilst Patients with a score of one or more um, did require endotherapy, particularly after the score um, exceeded uh, four. So the Blatchford score is the most useful test for discriminating low-risk upper GI bleed patients uh, who are not likely to need endoscopic hemostasis. There is also a fast-track Blatchford score um, which you can calculate by knowing the urea, the hemoglobin, the pulse, um, and the systolic blood pressure. So if the urea is less than 18, if the hemoglobin is greater than 13 in men or 12 in women, and there's no shock, then it is a low-risk patient who is unlikely to need endotherapy. Stanley et al. published a comparison of five major risk scoring systems uh, in upper GI bleed. Um, they looked at the Glasgow Bladford score, the pre-endoscopy Rockle score, the full Rockle score, the AIMS 65 score, and the PNED score. Um, they looked at over 3,000 consecutive patients with upper GI bleed collected over 12 months. Um, they found that the Glasgow Bladford score was the best of the bunch um, at predicting intervention or death with an area under the receiver operator curve of 0.86. Also, a Blatchford score of less than or equal to 1 was the optimum threshold to predict survival without intervention, with a sensitivity of 98.6% and a specificity of 34.6%. In addition, a Blatchford score of greater than or equal to 7 was the optimal threshold to predict endoscopic treatment, with a sensitivity of 80%, and a specificity of 57%. The NICE 2012 guidelines state that we should use uh, risk assessment scores for all patients with acute GI bleeding. Um, they suggest that we should use the Blatford score at the first assessment and the full Rockle score after endoscopy. But remember, uh, these guidelines uh, were published before um, the study by Stanley et al.
The NICE guidelines also state that we should consider early discharge if the pre-endoscopy blood FET score is zero. Let us now look at the timing of endoscopy. The NICE 2012 guidelines say that we should do an immediate endoscopy after resuscitation if the patient has severe acute upper GI bleed. In all other patients with acute upper GI bleed, the endoscopy can be done uh, within 24 hours. They say that units seeing more than 330 cases per year should offer daily endoscopy lists. And units with fewer than 330 cases per year should arrange their service according to local circumstances. So perhaps they might team up with another adjoining um, hospital and do cross cover. Now I would like to look at three important papers um, concerned with the timing of endoscopy. And these were all published after the NICE 2012 guidelines. The first of these three papers comes from um, Denmark. And this was a very large uh, nationwide study of over 12,500 patients. Um, they divided these patients into those who were hemodynamically stable and those who were hemodynamically unstable. And within each of these two groups, the further subdivided patients, uh, according to the ASA um, um, uh, grouping, so uh, we have one group called ASA 1 to 2, and another group ASA um, 3 to 5. So ASA 1 to 2 are generally fit patients, whereas uh, 3 to 5 indicates comorbid or moribund patient. Now, in the hemodynamically stable group, um, if we look at the ASA 1 and 2 um, category, then we can see that it doesn't matter what time we do the um, endoscopy, whether it's very early or very late, the mortality rate is more or less uh, the same. We've got a, a, a flat curve. Similarly, in the hemodynamically unstable group, in the ASA 1 or 2 um, subgroup, the mortality rate does not change much uh, irrespective of the timing of the endoscopy. However, if we look at the ASA 3 to 5 group, that's the red curve, uh, we can see that in the hemodynamically stable group, uh, the curve has a U-shaped um, configuration with high mortality rate at the beginning and a high mortality rate at the end and an optimal time here at between 12 hours and 36 hours. Similarly, in the hemodynamically unstable group, again, we have a U-shaped curve, and the best time for the endoscopy appears to be somewhere between um, 6 hours and uh, 24 hours uh, following presentation. The second study um, comes from Korea and was published um, in 2018. This was a prospective co uh, cohort study uh, which was non-randomized. Um, there were 961 patients um, who presented consecutively uh, with upper GI bleeding and who had a Glasgow Blatchford score of greater than 7. All of them had non-variceal upper GI bleeding and patients with a cancer bleed were excluded. The patients were divided into those who had an urgent endoscopy within six hours and those who had an elective endoscopy at between six and 48 hours. And in this study, uh, the notable um, and significant differences were seen in terms of 28-day mortality, which was um, lower at 1.6% um, in the urgent group compared to 3.8% in the elective group. Similarly, the red cell transfusion requirement uh, was higher slightly in the urgent group. The need for intervention was higher in the urgent group and embolization was also higher in the urgent group. But remember, uh, this was a non-randomized study and its results are at odds with the Danish study um, seen in the previous slide. The third study 
was published in 2020 and comes from the Hong Kong group. Uh, this study had 516 patients with a blood fit score of greater than 11. These patients were randomized into receiving either an urgent endoscopy within six hours or what they call an early endoscopy at between six and 24 hours. However, patients who were shocked or who were unstable after initial resuscitation were excluded from the study and went straight for urgent endoscopy. Now, in this study, the 30-day mortality rate was 8.9% in the urgent group and 6.6% in the early group. So the urgent group actually did worse uh, than the early group. And similarly, the rebleed rate in the first 30 days was higher in the urgent group than in the early group, 10.9% versus 7.8%. So in this group, uh, the urgent uh, endoscopy group did not fare any better than the early endoscopy group. Let us now look at pre-endoscopic pharmacotherapy, starting with proton pump inhibitors. Now, we all know that we should use intravenous proton pump inhibitors after an endoscopy if we find a, a peptic ulcer with significant stigmata. But what about using a proton pump inhibitor before endoscopy? Uh, for example, we could use um, 80 milligrams bolus followed by 8 milligrams an hour um, infusion. And the rationale is that this suppresses acid, facilitates clot formation and stabilization. And we can give it until at least um, the endoscopy is done and then continue um, if necessary, depending on the findings. And this strategy is recommended by the ESG 2015 guidelines, but not by the NICE um, 2012 guidelines who recommend its use only after um, endoscopy if stigmata is present. There was a Cochrane meta-analysis of six uh, RCTs uh, with over 2,000 patients in whom protein pump inhibitors were given before endoscopy. It was found that there was a decrease in the incidence of high-risk stigmata of hemorrhage at index endoscopy. 37.2% versus 46.5%. There was also the decrease in the need for endoscopic hemostasis, 88.6% versus 11.7%. But giving proton pump inhibitors had no effect on the rebleeding, the need for surgery, or on mortality. What about other agents? Uh, Tranaxamic acid is generally not recommended uh, pre-endoscopy. Neither is somatostatin. However, intravenous erythromycin, typically at a dose of 250 milligrams, is recommended by ESG E15 guidelines because uh, giving the erythromycin um, improves visibility and reduces the need uh, for a second look because of its prokinetic effect. And um, this results in emptying of the stomach. Also, prophylactic antibiotics and terdepressin uh, should be given if a very seal bleed is suspected. What about antiplatelets and anticoagulants? What should we do with these drugs in patients who present with an upper GI bleed? The recently pu uh, published guidelines from the BSG um, give us some advice on this matter. With aspirin, if the drug is used for primary prophylaxis, then we should stop it. If the aspirin is used for secondary prophylaxis, then we should continue with it. If the patient is on dual antiplatelet therapy, and this usually uh, means um, uh, coronary stent, then we should continue with both drugs. However, if for whatever reason um, the drugs are stopped, then we should restart as soon as possible and preferably within five days, and we should liaise with cardiologists whenever possible. With anticoagulants, that's both warfarin and um, novel agents, we should stop uh, the drugs and correct uh, coagulopathy using vitamin K, Beriplex and other agents. Uh, we should attempt to restart the anticoagulants as soon as possible when safe after the um, endotherapy. Now, 
2019, uh, the British Society of Gastroenterology, together with the Association of uh, Upper GI Surgeons and the Society of Acute Medicine, published a um, care bundle for the management of upper GI bleeding. And this is quite useful. Um, it's also quite easy to remember because everything begins with R. Recognition, resuscitation, risk assessment, um, Rx or treatment, referral and review. And some of the key things are shown here. For example, uh, perform MUSE as indicated, commence intravenous crystalloids, transfuse if the haemoglobin is less than 7, aim for a haemoglobin of between 7 and 10, calculate Glasgow score, discharge the Glasgow score is uh, 0 or 1, which is slightly different from the uh, NICE guidelines. If you suspect variceal bleeding, then start terlipressin and antibiotics, uh, continue aspirin, suspend all other antithrombotic, um, and so on. So it's a nice um, one-page um, summary of what you should do when faced with a patient with an upper GI bleed. Let us now look at non-variceal bleeds in particular. This slide shows uh, peptic ulcers and they have been grouped according to the Forish classification uh, which was first published in 1974 and which describes stigmata um, of recent bleeds. In the 1A lesion we have a spurting uh, blood vessel. In the 1B lesion we have a oozing uh, blood vessel on the surface of the ulcer. With a 2A lesion, there is a visible um, non-bleeding vessel on the base. With a 2B lesion, there's an adherent clot. The 2C lesion uh, is where we have a flat hematinic spot. And a type 3 lesion is where the base is clean. The risk of mortality and rebleed uh, can be predicted from the stigmata of recent hemorrhage. With a 1A lesion, the mortality rate is about 12% and the rebleed rate is 50 to 60%. With a 2A lesion, the rebleed rate is about 45% and the mortality is around 10%. With a 2B lesion, the um, rebleed rate is about 22% and the mortality rate is 7%. With a 2C lesion, rebleed rate is lower at 10% and the mortality rate is around 3%. And with a type 3 lesion, both rebleed and mortality rates are even lower. So based on these figures, uh, 1A, 1B, and 2A lesions are termed major stigmata of recent hemorrhage, whilst um, 2C and 3 are termed minor stigmata of recent hemorrhage, whilst this one, uh, the adherent clot, or 2B, is... Um, probably a major stigmata, although there is some um, controversy. So generally speaking, um, 1A, 1B and 2A lesions should be subject to endotherapy, whilst 2C and 3 lesions uh, generally do not need any endotherapy, whilst uh, 2B is a grey area, and some guidelines suggest that you should pull this clot off to see what lies underneath and treat if necessary. This brings us nicely to endotherapy. So what modalities are available to us? Well, these days we are spoiled for choice. We have injection therapy in the form of adrenaline, sclerosin such as ethanol, ethanolamine, uh, STD and polydocanol. We have histroacryl glue, which is used primarily for the management of gastric varices. We have thrombin, which can also be used for gastric varices and fibrin. We have thermal modalities, which can be contact or non-contact. Amongst the contact group, we have BICAP, gold probe, and heater probe. And in the non-contact group, we have argon plasma coagulation and laser, which is not used much these days. Uh, we have mechanical therapy using clips, which can be through the scope or over the scope. And we have banding uh, for, uh, for varices in particular. And then... We have hemostatic powder sprays and gels such as Purostat and other modalities uh, such as the use of uh, stents in specialised situations.
the ESG e guidelines from 2015 um, help us to decide which patients to treat um, endoscopically. Basically, um, they divide patients into three groups, high-risk stigmata, adherent clots, and low-risk stigmata. In the patients with high-risk stigmata, that is active spurting, active oozing, or a non-bleeding visible vessel, we should generally perform endoscopic hemostasis. In the spurting and oozing group, we should use combination endotherapy using um, adrenaline plus a second modality, such as contact uh, thermal treatment or mechanical treatment or a sclerosant. In patients with a um, non-bleeding vessel, we should use uh, th a contact thermal treatment, mechanical treatment, or injection of a sclerosant alone, or um, in combination with adrenaline. And afterwards, we should give um, high-dose intravenous PPI as a bolus, followed by continuous infusion, and we should eradicate H. pylori if present. In the low-risk group, um, that is flat pigmented spot or clean base, no endoscopic hemostasis is required, and these patients can be discharged home on oral PPIs, and they should also receive H. pylori eradication if the clot test is positive. So th that leaves us with this gray area, that is patients with an adherent clot. The guidelines uh, give a bit of wiggle room. Uh, they say that we should consider performing clot removal followed by endoscopic hemostasis of uh, any underlying high-risk stigmata, or if you don't fancy that, you can opt for medical management with high-dose intravenous PPI. If you do opt for endotherapy, then you should use uh, dilute adrenaline injection um, circumferentially to the base of the clot, followed by removal of the clot using a snare, for example. And then if we find any underlying high-risk stigmata, such as a visible vessel or active bleeding, uh, then you should um, use hemostasis as described for um, 1A and 1B lesions. So what about adrenaline? Uh, well, this drug normally comes in a concentration of 1 in 10,000, and we inject it uh, typically in aliquots of 0.5 to 2 mils. The drug causes vasoconstriction and tamponade and is used widely for non-variceal upper GI bleeds. But what volumes of adrenaline should we be using? Uh, there are two studies, both of them quite old, looking at this matter. The first study uh, from 2002 compared uh, large volumes, that is more than 13 mils, against low volumes, which typically meant between 5 and 10 mils. And it was found that the large volume group did better in terms of recurrent bleeding. In the second study, which was published in 2006, the authors compared 20 mils of adrenaline with 30 mils and 40 mils. Although the 40 mil group had the lowest recurrent bleed rate, they had the highest perforation rate of 5.3% and the highest epigastric pain rate of 67%. In this study, it seemed that the 30 mil group did the best in terms of rebleed and few complications. So taking the two studies together, it seems that the optimal volume lies somewhere between 13 mils and 30 mils. The NICE guidelines from 2012 do not recommend the use of adrenaline as monotherapy. They recommend the use of uh, adrenaline with thermal coagulation or with fibrin or thrombin. The only method um, that they recommend as monotherapy is mechanical methods such as CLIPS. And even then, uh, the adrenaline is, uh, is optional. So what are the other methods that we have at our disposal? Uh, the gold probe is a... A typical uh, thermal device which is available in many units and also has facilities for um, injection. Uh, we typically use uh, soft quag uh, at, at, at around uh, 20 watts and we apply coaptive thermocoagulation uh, onto the bleeding vessel leaving a footprint uh, after the application. The argon plasma coagulation um, is a non-contact 
device uh, in which we have uh, a plasma jet uh, emerging uh, from an electrode and this causes a shallow uh, uniform coagulation. The catheter that we use uh, is usually an axial device but can fire sideways or circumferentially and different um, modes are available, pulsed, precise and forced. Generally, argon plasma coagulation is used for um, vascular bleeds, but there are studies showing its usefulness with um, peptic ulcer bleeds as well. Here is an example um, of a peptic ulcer bleed with oozing. Uh, this is before treatment and this is after treatment with adrenaline and APC immediately after treatment and 24 hours later. Next we have clips and uh, there are two types of clips available uh, through the scope clips and over the uh, scope clips. Uh, this slide shows examples of through the scope clips made by uh, the main companies. So that's um, uh, Boston with the Resolution and Resolution 360 clips, Cook with the Instinct clips and Olympus with their quick clips. And these clips have various characteristics in terms of jaw span, opening angles, MRI compatibility, uh, rotatability, and reopening capability. Um, note that the Olympus um, clips are not MRI compatible. Uh, the two main over-the-scope clips are the Ovesco clips and the padlock clip. Uh, the Ovesco clips um, have this bear trap uh, design with uh, strong jaws which clamp together over a blood vessel. Um, it's deployed using a turn handle release mechanism similar to a banding device. Uh, in contrast, the padlock looks uh, more symmetrical uh, with these hexagonal daggers pointing uh, inwards and that's deployed using this press button uh, mechanism. Next we have hemostatic powder spray and the two main uh, sprays that are available uh, are the endoclot spray um, produced by Premier and the hemospray produced by Wilson Cook. The endoclock device has a reusable uh, pump uh, and a catheter with a container of um, the active substance here. Uh, the powder is tipped um, into the um, uh, flow of air and travels down the catheter uh, into the patient. Uh, the active ingredient is a starch-derived absorbable modified polymer or AMP particles uh, which has no human or animal component. The air compressor propels the powder through the catheter uh, and the way it acts is that the powder absorbs water from the bleeding lesion concentrating the platelets, clotting factors and red cells thereby promoting clot formation and formation of a gelled matrix and this device is CE approved. The hemospray by Wilson Cook uses a proprietary mineral blend powder called TC325 and again has no human uh, or animal proteins or botanicals. Um, it has a slightly different propulsion mechanism using a carbon dioxide canister which propels the powder through the catheter. The mechanism of, of action is similar to endoclot. Um, it absorbs water from the bleeding lesion, concentrating the platelets, clotting factors and red cells, th thereby promoting clot formation and the formation of a mechanical plug. And we also have this agent, um, which is um, becoming more generally available, called Purostat. Uh, this is made by uh, a company called 3D Matrix from Tokyo, and the active ingredient is a self-assembling synthetic peptide um, formed by three amino acids, arginine, alanine and aspartic acid, uh, which form the RADA16 um, molecule, which then forms the building block um, of the peptide. Uh, the Purostat comes in syringes, um, which are typically three or five mils in volume, and is a slightly viscous liquid, which is applied 
on to the surface of the bleeding area and forms a transparent gel matrix which induces hemostasis. Let us now move on to variceal bleeding. Esophageal varices occur in one-third of patients with cirrhosis. One-third of initial bleeding episodes will prove to be fatal, and amongst the survivors, one-third will re-bleed within six weeks. Only one-third of patients will survive one year or more. So whichever way you look at it, this is a very serious situation indeed. The NICE 2012 guidelines state that we should administer prophylactic antibiotic therapy at presentation if we suspect or, uh, or confirm variceal bleeding. We should use band ligation for bleeding from esophageal varices and consider tips if the bleed is not controlled by the banding. The NICE guidelines recommend the use of N-butyl 2-cyanoacrylate glue for bleeding from gastric varices. And if uh, the bleeding does not stop with the glue, then we should consider TIPS. Uh, this slide gives a nice acronym for the management of variceal bleeding. Vasoconstrictor therapy, antibiotics, resuscitation, ICU level care, endoscopy and endotherapy, alternative or rescue therapies, and beta blockade. Regarding vasoconstrictor therapy, our goal is to reduce spanklic blood flow. And the drug that we use most commonly is, of course, terdepressin. This is the only agent shown to improve um, the control of bleeding and survival in randomized control studies and meta-analyses. Uh, in the past, we've used uh, vasopressin and GTN, but these have too many adverse effects. Um, some countries where terdepressin is not licensed use somatostatin and octreotide, which have um, similar modes of action. The NICE 2012 guidelines state that we should offer terdepressin if we suspect variceal bleeding at presentation and stop treatment after definitive hemostasis has been achieved or after five days unless there is another indication for its use. Regarding antibiotics, a bacterial infection occur in up to 66% of patients with cirrhosis and variceal bleeding, and this has a negative impact on hemostasis. Um, therefore, we should use prophylactic antibiotics um, which reduce the incidence of bacterial infection and significantly reduce early re-bleeding. The trials have used uh, keftrioxone um, at one gram intravenously uh, QDS for five to seven days, and an alternative to this is norfloxacin 400 milligrams um, orally uh, BD. Uh, we've done resuscitation, um, and it goes without saying that resuscitation should be prompt, uh, but with caution. The goal is to maintain hemodynamic stability with a hemoglobin of 7 to 8. Uh, we should avoid excessive rapid overexpansion of volume, and this may increase portal pressure and a greater risk of bleeding. Endoscopy should be performed as soon as possible after resuscitation and usually within 24 hours. Um, endotracheal intubation may be necessary uh, to protect the airways. Band ligation is the preferred method for esophageal varices and uh, cyanoacrylate glue or thrombin um, may be used for gastric varices. Alternative or rescue therapies include TIPS or transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Early placement of such a shunt within 24 to 72 hours is associated with improved survival amongst high-risk patients. It is the preferred treatment for gastric variceal bleeding if glue injection fails, but we should rule out splenic vein thrombosis first. Another uh, alternative or rescue therapy is the sengstarkin blakemore tube, which is very effective for immediate but temporary control. Uh, basically, uh, this um, tube has two balloons, a gastric balloon and an esophageal balloon. And the modern uh, tubes have four ports, um, one for the gastric balloon, one for the esophageal balloon, uh, one 
for gastric aspiration and one for um, esophageal aspiration. Generally speaking, we only need to inflate the gastric balloon, uh, usually with uh, 300 mils um, of air, and then we can apply traction to this end of the tube uh, using a bag of saline uh, tied to the end of the tube. Uh, however, it should be noted that the Sankstarkin tube has a high complication rate, uh, and these complications include aspiration, migration, necrosis, and perforation of the esophagus. It is usually used as a bridge to tips uh, within 24 hours, um, and it is generally recommended that, that the airways should be protected uh, when inserting the tube. Another alternative or rescue therapy is the use of a self-expanding metal stent. Now, um, there are specially designed covered metal stents available, and the purpose of such a stent is to apply tamponade to the distal esophageal varices. Uh, these stents are removable and generally does not require um, airway protection. However, the data on the use of such a stent uh, is very limited at the moment. Uh, finally, we have a beta blockade. Uh, beta blockers, we know, reduce the risk of recurrent variceal hemorrhage, but we should use non-selective beta blockers, typically cavidolol or propranolol. Uh, these beta blockers uh, cause splanchnic vasoconstriction. Uh, they decrease the cardiac output, um, and we should um, titrate up to a maximum tolerated dose, uh, which produces a heart rate of 50 to 60. Uh, the beta blockers should be started as an inpatient uh, once acute bleeding has resolved and the patient shows hemodynamic stability. And this uh, brings me to the end of the slide part of the presentation. And now I'd like to show you some um, short videos showing endotherapy. All of these videos are available on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Ahmed. And you're very welcome um, to go over to this site and um, have a look at these videos. Thank you very much.